Um, just give me in uh, 20 seconds how it actually works. What, yes. what difference it makes to your life? And imagine yeah. I'm a patient. How, how does it change your life? Yeah. So I started off as a patient mm -hmm. and um, I was diagnosed with tuberculosis in 2014. And um, I started collecting medication for my local clinic. And my biggest challenge was the fact that I have to manage my treatment, but at the same time, I have to manage my, the time that it takes. The idea was, can we get somebody in and out of the clinic in under 36 seconds? And how can we do that? So with the Pillarbox Smart Locker, it's a bank of uh, digital lockers where we put pre-packed pre medicine, loaded inside. It then sends an SMS saying, Chris, your medication is ready for collection at your local clinic. Here's a one-time PID. You then simply go to the unit, um, mm. which has a touch screen on it, enter uh, your cell phone number together with your PIN. It then opens one of the doors that has your medicine inside. You collect and you're on your way. So you don't have to stand around waiting in long no. queues for chronic no. medication. No. Yeah. Now, in terms of disruption, what is this likely to do to like pharmacies? I mean, could it uh, affect pharma? Could we don't need pharmacies anymore uh, for chronic no. medication? So one of the challenges in, in our continent, and I think um, in our country particularly, we've gone through, we had to put a lot of people on, if you look at HIV, we had, a lo we had to put a lot of people on, on treatment. But we didn't improve the underlying infrastructure that came with needing to manage that burden of disease. So a lot of our public facilities are clogged and they are oversubscribed. Um, now the idea is we also don't produce enough pharmacists um, to be able to help um, with these facilities. And this technology enables that particular part where you can have somebody who's come in to collect the same treatment, uh, be able to have a dignified service, but at the other same time be able to have um, systems that still govern how we dispense medication in the country, um, still being adhered to, while we ensure that for the, ben for the, for the, for the patient, um, that access is improved and it's a lot more efficient um, and it works for what they ultimately need. Now, Pele Box has got nothing to do with the footballer. It's as in Pele, as in people. Yes. yes. Um, so in Setswana, uh, <laughs> Pile means uh, Pile. It has, yeah, it means three things: um, being in front, uh, being fast, um, and effectively being first. So <laughs> the idea was we want to put patients at the front of the queue. We want to get them to collect medication fast, and we want to put them at the f uh, we want to put them first in terms of how we provide service. But you, you uh, surely you've only just started on this. I mean, surely there's plenty of other things you could disrupt now with this technology. And what would you be looking to disrupt? in the future, which other markets, apart from pharmacists we've talked about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're still interested in the access to medicine space. We feel like there's a lot of um, efficiency that can be improved on the process of how medicine goes from a pharma all the way till a patient actually has to um, look at this particular thing. If you look at one of the biggest challenges that um, I th um, a few people have tried to attempt to solve um, is looking at adherence, looking at what are the ways of measuring that uh, people are actually taking treatment and that their actual clinical outcomes are good. Um, so I feel like there's a th that space is also ripe for disruption. It's mm. also interesting and intriguing uh, for anybody that can create something that has a high enough of a sticky product that can effectively serve people and ensure so social impact. Well, I'm sure a lot of people out there are watching, are prompting me to answer this next question. How, how do you actually make money out of this? And very well, you, you make it easier for me to get my chronic medication, yeah. but how do you make money? What sort of percentage do you make on that? Yeah, so the business model is very simple. The idea was, yes, we are targeting the 83% of the patients that are reliant on the state-funded care. Um, the state is there to effectively provide the service. Um, so in a nutshell, our, our client is the National Ministry of Health. Um, we work with other NGOs and other corporates that have high volume of employees um, where they want to ensure that somebody's not taking a whole day's worth of leave to collect treatment. Um, what if we put a pillar box at your workplace and you effectively can collect medication? Um, we a then offer the product and a rental model um, where they would be able to pay for the asset together with the service that comes with it, um, ensuring that, um, that patient centricity, that ability to focus on how people access their treatment um, is, is sort of um, done. On the Department of Health lens, it's very much about public service and ensuring that we have technology that can improve service delivery. Now, what about development? That's another thing that I'm always interested in with the disruptors. disruptors. You go into the bank and you say, listen, I've got this brilliant thing. Yeah. I can help chronic patients. Yeah. Can you <laughs> give me some money? To, and what did they say when you went there? Uh, the bank said no. I oh. mean, we actually did that. But then I think <laughs> one thing that we picked up around the innovation journey is that you have to look for people that are currently incentivized to solve this problem. So, so how did you finance um, it? We were able to raise funding from um, the... Um, the 
um, well, two things. We're able to raise funding from um, the Innovation Hub. Um, so they effectively look at innovations that have a very strong ability to scale and uh, public service. It is taxpayers' money mm -hmm. um, that has been used by the Innovation Hub through the Department of Science and Technology to effectively springboard um, innovations. Um, so it's an incubated program that looks at young aspiring innovation uh, innovators that want to create uh, programs. And we were also fortunate enough to win um, a really, really amazing prize that was sponsored by the city of Johannesburg, looking at innovations that foster um, social impact and service delivery. So that was about a million rand um, that we were able to um, gain from a competition called Hack Josie that helped us with uh, the R&D uh, cost for the product. It's a terrible shame, isn't it? Young, young guys like yourself, you come up with these ideas, you work on them, you present them <coughs> to the financial institutions. Yeah. And I can name you a string of hundreds yeah. more I've interviewed. And every time, the people say, sorry, the bank people say, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not interested. And they'll only come back to you in maybe 10 years' time when <laughs> you've made money out of it. But yeah. it's a bit of a missed opportunity for this continent. It is, it? it is. And I feel like, and, and I think it's a, it's a gap for a lot of other players to come mm. in, where if somebody says, actually, I want to look at early stage investment, I want to invest in, I want to look at young guys that are coming up, the banks are not going to touch them because they want surety. Um, as a young innovator, you don't have that surety. You don't have that um, tons and tons of rand sitting in your bank account for you to issue to the bank. Um, and part of why we're innovating is just so that we can solve our own problems. And the, the idea is why the, I think there are organizations out there that if one is zealous enough and uh, really, really willing to challenge, looking at the Innovation Hub, um, the Technology Innovation Agency, um, that is, and CSIR, those are public institutions that are invested in developing technology out there so that technology can be commercialized in the long run as well. And it's a very fashionable thing to say these days, but do you ever consider crowdfunding, you know, going <laughs> to people you know and saying, Look, um, give me 100 rand and yeah. so you I mean, did. If you, if you think about a stock fell, it is exactly that. So, so we, we were able to raise funding from okay. friends and family, Excellent. Um, very much at the beginning stages so that we can actually get the concept from idea um, to a prototype. Um, and then from prototype, then you look at other funders that are willing to say, oh, we've seen that you've taken the next step. I'm willing to help you build a commercial product. Um, and, and if you understand the funding landscape and you understand who's willing to help you at what particular point, mm. um, you're able to rather be frustrated with the bank saying no, and let's say four of them <laughs> saying no, um, <laughs> than rather say, actually, who is more likely to say yes? yes? And how do I have that conversation with that particular organization or person? So um, the other question <laughs> I've got for you, I mean, I, I've probably, I've interviewed some of the top politicians in this country in the last yeah. quarter of a century. And I say to them, what's the big shortage in your economy? And they say, engineers and scientists, right? Yeah. Okay. And I say, fine. But I say, why then do you, most countries in this continent run a system where mm -hmm. people are brought up to be civil servants, they're brought up to be teachers, they're mm -hmm. brought up to be, have nice, safe jobs. Yeah. Why is it we aren't pushing? Did, how did you get pushed into the engineering disrupting space? Yes. So I trained as an electrical engineer uh, from the University of Cape Town. I then went, I worked in the manufacturing for... Mm. Um, Making what? Making steel um, <laughs> for ArcelorMittal and oh, uh, working as an automation engineer in, in a, in a, in a steel-making plant. Um, I got attracted by the technology scene, the innovation scene. And uh, if, you, if you look at the Jeff Bezos, the Steve Jobs mm. of these worlds, those stories are very exciting. And um, my idea was to then say, I don't want to build a career in steel. I'd rather work in the innovation space. Um, it's not as romantic as it sounds, and it's <laughs> not romantic as the, the, the books make it out to be. But the, the idea of this next frontier, this um, uh, fourth industrial revolution, where Africans can effectively create technologies that can have social impact, that can serve people, and that can scale, um, was a lot more attractive. I mean, I only. I'm, I'm, I work in healthcare, um, having trained as an electrical engineer. Um, <laughs> those are two different, I never saw this particular career um, sort of turning out. And I mean, I enjoy it now. You see how you can take um, skills in industrial engineering and apply them to cues in manufacture in, 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 in a clinic and say, how do I de-bottleneck this um, the system? And I feel like if, if more and more people want to cross-pollinate skills um, so that we can effectively uh, be able to introduce new ideas into health that come from manufacturing, and you end up with a whole new innovation that wouldn't have been otherwise existed. Thank you very much indeed for your time and fascinating insights there from Neil Hutiri, an engineer who uh, started out making steel, and now he's invented a disrupting uh, device called Pele Box that helps people get their chronic medication.